Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Majid. I request one of my colleagues to present the program. Thank you very much. I, I was actually born in India, so it's a great uh, honor to me to come back and hopefully inspire a, a new generation of Indians. So, uh, firstly, uh, I must mention my university, Queen Mary, University of London. I'm a director of pure mathematics there. The, um, the, we, we have uh, an excellent MSc program for mathematics, financial mathematics, also other subjects, engineering, etc. Uh, we have PhD research programs, and uh, we're also based in East London, which means that you are near Brick Lane, so you'll have the best Indian food in London if you're getting homesick. So, uh, do, do uh, think about that. Now, I will be talking on the topic of this book of essays, which was mentioned. Uh, other contributors to this book are Alan Kahn, Fields Medalist, uh, Roger Penrose, uh, and I have a chapter there as well, from the space time. And what we try to do in this book is to show you, to show the uh, general public, that the very notion of space and time is not something that is understood at all, and it's still a very exciting and fundamental thing to think about. So, although there are lots of revolutions going on in technology, internet, uh, Facebook, etc., we should still have time, I hope, to think about really fundamental things um, and research in them, like what is the nature of space and time. So, for example, for time, uh, is time uh, some kind of river that flows along at a constant rate? Uh, is it part of some space time continuum? Is it uh, something to do with entropy increasing? Or is it, uh, if you believe the matrix, some kind of uh, computer clock uh, in some other cosmic computer? Or is it a sociological invention? And so these are all things I will touch upon. But I am coming at this as a pure mathematician. And I should just say something very simple about that. You should, nature doesn't know what is written in math books. So if you really want to understand the true nature of something, like the nature of space and time, you can't just pick up a math book and look for the equations in there. Because equations may not have been written down yet. The very concepts may not, may not have been written down yet. So you have to be a pure mathematician to be um, a theoretical physicist. Not to be an applied one. Obviously, you can compute lots of things if you, somebody gives you the equations. But if you want to understand why the world is the way it is, so think about fundamental issues, then you, you can't disentangle that from pure mathematics. Now, concerning time, the um, first thing I want to tell you, which many people, now, uh, many people now know, is proposition one. Time, time uh, is not a smoothly increasing quantity t, independent of the observer. So that was how Newton, I think Newton thought about it. T was a variable in his equations for the motion of planets and, and uh, movement under gravity. But it was some kind of thing that was out there independently of us. And we know that isn't true anymore. Uh, so for example, time dilation um, is a phenomena that in time is experienced more slowly in a strong gravitational field or for someone moving at speed relative to you. So for example, uh, if you are falling into a, if you watch somebody falling into a black hole, this is not actually a black hole, but the same thing applies to a black hole. Um, you, if you are an astronaut falling into a black hole, we would see you falling in, uh, but you would see you floating on the edge of the black hole, and it would actually take an infinite amount of time for you to fall in. We don't actually see you falling into the black hole. Whereas from the point of view of the astronaut, you would fall into the black hole and you'd die in an infinite, in a finite time. So. Time, but only a short amount of time of experience for him. At the same event, uh, we experience an infinite time. So that's an extreme case, falling to a black hole. But even around the surface of the Earth, uh, a satellite in geostationary orbit will have a slightly different rate of time relative to us. And that's actually needed for your sat-nav to work accurately. Um, you know, the first uh, versions of sat-navs weren't that accurate, and it's because they were not aligned for time dilation. So it's, uh, this was uh, uncovered by Einstein, um, in his theory of special relativity. And uh, it's explained as part by his idea that time is part of a space-time continuum. So we've known this for uh, more than a, well, about 100 years now, 
and we use it now in every day, even though most of us still think of time as something that everybody agrees on, as something that's absolute. It's not true, and we've known that for more than 100 years, and it actually matters in technology. Okay. So that was one revolution that happened after Newton. Proposition two is that Einstein is also wrong. So what we now think um, in 2000, or in the 19th, since the 1990s, is that there probably is no space-time continuum at all. And Einstein was wrong about that. But even worse, no one knows what there really is. So this is a very exciting time. It's like going back to the time before Isaac Newton, where you had a certain amount of experimental data, but you didn't have a theory, you didn't have a conceptual understanding. I and mean, we are actually in that situation now. We need another Einstein, or another Ramanujan, but with Einstein's philosophy concerning physics, perhaps, um, and to, to provide some kind of revolution, and we are on the brink of that. Now, what Einstein did was, he actually contributed to a revolution theory of gravity, but also to quantum theory. Um, people don't necessarily realize that, but he was also a pioneer of quantum theory. And he spent, but he spent the later years of his life failing to unify those two. So quantum theory was one of the things he did, gravity was another, but he never managed to put them into a single theory. And unlike many physicists in the last 20 years, he never pretended otherwise. He always thought that problem was unsolved. Uh, and this failure to unify quantum theory and gravity, in other words, the lack of a theory of quantum gravity, um, even today, um, and so in particular, string theory doesn't provide that answer. Uh, I hope there are no string theorists in the audience. I'm pretty sure there aren't, so I can say that. Um, uh, has its roots, um, this failure has its roots in a mistaken assumption of a continuum. So the idea that space and time are infinitely divisible. So the first thing I want to show you is that, logically speaking, that is a mistaken assumption, even though you all probably assume it, right? You can wave your hands around in space and time, and it's obviously some kind of continuous thing, right? But is that true? So I'm, since there are a lot of engineers here, I can feel safe in using uh, a, log, a log, log diagram. So. This is a plot of everything in the universe. It's what I call the big picture. And uh, on the x-axis, I've put the, ma the, the mass of the object, mass energy, not uh, including, including uh, other forms of mass, um, in logarithmic units. So each block represents 10 to the 10, a uh, factor of 10 to the 10. Um, then along the vertical axis, I've put the size in centimeters. Again, each block is about 10 to 10. And now everything uh, to the left of this line is forbidden by quantum mechanics, and I will show you why that's the case. Uh, and everything on the right of this line is forbidden by gravity, and I will show you why that's the case. So this is one theory of physics that we have today, gravity. Another very good theory of physics, quantum theory. They, they put limits. Everything in the universe is in this uh, wedge-shaped region. It's quite interesting why we, humans, are in the middle. And I will come back to that. I understand I have a, a, a second lecture tomorrow, um, which is my scheduled lecture, so I will speak more about the philosophy of that, uh, uh, the notion of representation and reality uh, in that lecture. But that's the question we'll come back to. But what I want to point out today is that there was one point where quantum theory and gravity collide, and that's here. So objects which are, it's called the Planck scale, so objects which are about 10 to the minus 5 grams, and which are about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters in size, here, they are quantum, they are, to understand those objects, we would need a theory of quantum gravity, and we have no such theory. So we have, we simply don't know what the real world looks like for objects around here. And anyone who tells you otherwise uh, is exaggerating. So um, that's the big picture. Now, uh, just to say that I did put the whole universe in up there. So the universe has a certain size and a mass. So it's for the top as well. 
And um, things on here like galaxies, quasars, black holes. Sigma Sex was one of the first black holes. Humans, I mentioned. On here we have light, electrons, and protons. So we'll come back to this in a second. Now, to understand physics, we need to probe it. Uh, we need, and we need, so we need to, it's, well, sorry, I'm going to explain those two lines first. So the left slope, quantum theory, I'm not going to tell you a whole lot of quantum theory, except for one equation, this one. So, well, we'll start at the beginning. Planck discovered that light of a given wavelength, lambda, has, comes in packets with energy, E equals H bar C over lambda. Uh, H is uh, Planck's constant. Meanwhile, Einstein... Uh, discovered that mass and energy are interchangeable with uh, the formula e equals mc squared that many of you will have seen somewhere that's on somebody's t-shirt um, and uh, the, this was discovered by Einstein and c here is the speed of light now um, if you combine, if you eliminate e between those two equations you'll see that lambda is h bar over mc so that mean, and so this, is, this formula works for all kinds of particles. There is a kind of duality, wave-particle dualism, in which all elementary particles, like electrons even, uh, are waves at the same time. And a particle of mass m is also a wave of wavelength lambda. And if you don't believe that, uh, here is um, an electron wave scattering uh, of uh, atomic defects in a copper crystal. So this is taken using an electron scanning microscope. You can see the waves. So that's something. Uh, that, so, so what that means is, is that um, a certain mass has a certain wavelength, and if you increase the mass, then the wavelength gets smaller, and that's this slope here. So that's this slope here. The wavelength is inversely proportional to the mass. And as you uh, increase the mass from an electron to a proton, or from light, well, we won't worry about that, but increase the mass, then the wavelength gets smaller. <laughs> now, the other side of, the, of that diagram, of the big picture, was gravity. And the modern way of thinking uh, about gravity, due to Einstein, uh, is that uh, really gravity is, a, is some kind of curvature. Uh, of something of some of some space time, and just to illustrate that, here's a picture of an ant uh, or any kind of object crawling about on this surface. This is a surface of constant negative curvature, and as the ant starts to pee, and at each moment it crawls around in a in what it thinks is a straight line, uh, but in the end it will end up moving along that path, which is a geodesic. So the surface, the shape of the surface determines what is the closest thing to a straight line for a particle moving on that curved surface. And what Einstein realized was that gravity should be understood that way, as we are all moving in straight in, in geodesics, or, or, or if you like, the closest thing you can get to a straight line, but in some, some sort of curved space-time, um, uh, four-dimensional space-time with curvature. The curvature, visible here in the curvature of the trumpet shape, uh, is, is gravity. And one of the first things that came out of that was the idea that curve could, space could be so curved up on itself that it forms a black hole. And there's a formula for that. Um, a black hole of mass m has a size, it's actually half the Schwarzschild radius, but has an associated size which is proportional to the mass. So this is Newton's constant, 10 to the minus 8 in suitable units. Uh, this is the mass of the black hole, and this is the speed of light. And so what that says is that the size of, some, of a black hole is proportional to its mass. Okay, uh, so that's the slope. That's this slope here. So if you try to put too much mass, if you try to cross this boundary and try to put too much mass into a given volume of space, it will form a black hole. It'll be on, this is the line of black holes. See, sigma sex is on that line. And if you try to put more mass into it, it will just go up the slope. Um, okay, so that's, that's that line. So that's why you can't get too much matter in a given space, and you can't get too little matter in a given space either for the, for the, for the other effect, in some sense. Those are the two equations. So those theories are very well established since the 1920s. 
Um, but they do have this problem. So now let's think about, um, realistically, how we answer the question about the true nature of the space and time. So we should think about this um, in terms of how you would actually go about probing space-time. And the point is, is that to probe something, you need to shine light on it or to probe it with some other kind of sensors using some kind of waves of some kind. And that the wavelength of, what, of the probe that you use will determine the resolution. Okay? So for example, with a radio telescope, you might have several meters of wavelength, and that's fine for astronomical objects. Then for uh, light, you might have a telescope or a microscope and get down to a certain wavelength, on the nanometer scale, well, hundreds of nanometers. To go smaller than that, you have, to, you, have, you have to use electron waves. So electron waves have a much smaller wavelength than light waves, so you can probe much more finely using an electron microscope. And I like to think of the Large Hadron Collider as a proton microscope. It fires protons at things, and it uses the protons to, uh, to study the structure at that sort of uh, length scale. So that's uh, our Hadron Collider. So now what's happening here is, in this chart, is that we are decreasing the wavelength to get to, get to probe smaller and smaller distances. And for that, we need probes. But those probes will have mass by the formula I showed you, the wavelength formula. Um, they will have heavier and heavier quantum particles. So protons are heavier than electrons, etc. So to probe smaller and smaller distances by quantum wave particles, we need heavier and heavier particles as we move down the left slope. Okay, so I've probably said this more than once now. Uh, well, so here's our diagram again. And to go down the left slope, we need heavier and heavier particles to probe smaller and smaller distances. So light, electron, proton. Now, as we approach the Planck scale, 10 to the minus 33, the mass energy of the probes that we are using approaches this other line, the line of black holes. So that means the mass energy uh, distorts the space, the geometry of the space that we are trying to observe, and distorts it so much that they form black holes. That's what happens at this line. So that means that, actually, you can never observe distances smaller than the Planck scale, because as you approach the Planck scale, the things that you are using to, 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 to measure those distances uh, themselves destroy the geometry you're trying to measure. It becomes a fundamental impossibility. So that's a conceptual inconsistency between quantum theory and gravity. Quantum theory, fine, you could probe any scale by having smaller and smaller wavelengths. But because of gravity, those probes would form black holes and destroy the thing you were trying to probe. So, that, so that's a conceptual inconsistency between the, between the two. We, assumed, um, we assume a continuum in formulating physics. We just assume it. But, but in fact, distances less than 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, centimeters are intrinsically unknowable. And that means that they are an, the continuum hypothesis is an article of faith. It's an assumption which is based more in history and to do with what Newton was having for breakfast than, than to do with actual um, physics, uh, with science. It has no place in science. And in particular, it, it, uh, it causes insurmountable problems. These modes down here, which we can never detect, which are, which are matters of faith, if you like, distances beyond the Planck scale, they cause infinities in quantum theory and those infinities are in, on, insurmountable, and that's why there is today no theory of quantum gravity. So it's not only a, um, it's not a harmless assumption, it's an assumption which actually causes problems. <coughs> the other thing I should mention is that if you are have a black hole, when the Large Hadron Collider was being turned on, there was a lot of fear that it might form a black hole which would then swallow up the Earth. Uh, at least some people were afraid of that. And Stephen Hawking went on the TV and said, actually, don't worry, because if a black hole was formed, it would evaporate. So there is a phenomenon where black holes evaporate. So if you have a black hole being formed, it would slowly evaporate and move down that slope. It would get less size and also less mass. But the truth is that we don't know what would happen when those black holes evaporating reach the Planck scale. 
they could very well stabilize into some kind of hybrid object, because we have no idea about the physics of that scale. There could be some kind of balancing between the pressure to, as it loses mass, it will have a quantum tendency to increase its wavelength. On the other hand, it will have a gravitational tendency to shrink. And those two could balance each other. So I don't actually believe that black holes evaporate. Uh, but I'm obviously uh, in a... Uh, well, no, no, a number of people also don't also believe what I'm saying there. So, um, however, before you get worried, I don't think black, black holes can't be formed at the Large Hadron Collider. That was, to my mind, uh, uh, some propaganda to gain publicity for the LHC. Um, now, um, let's turn to other things about the universe that are completely not understood. One of them is uh, dark energy. So, dark matter and dark energy are totally unexplained features of our universe. This is a this is a, um, a, 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 a computer reconstruction showing the dark matter halo around a typical galaxy. You're not actually seeing your actually see that, but it's obtained by analyzing the orbital motions of the galaxies around and um, uh, and deducing the existence of the dark matter. Uh, but it's very, it's very concretely observed now, and, and 70 percent of our energy in the universe actually is in this mysterious energy density uniformly spread throughout the universe, which is something different called dark energy, and that's an energy density of 10 to the minus 29 grams per centimeter cubed. Now, this, these are observational facts, but they present a real mystery for theoreticians. If we have a theory of quantum gravity, or we should be able to explain um, the, the, these phenomena. And there was a theoretical explanation called of zero point energy. Um, if you ever watched the US show called Stargate, they, this is a picture of a zero point module. So zero point energy was first proposed by Arthur C. Clarke as a limitless source of energy uh, for use in science fiction. Uh, but, uh, and there is a sort of scientific basis for it. Um, but if you do the calculation, you would get infinity. Uh, and that's because these modes, these modes down here, uh, each of the modes contribute to the vacuum to the zero point energy, and these modes going off to infinity of infinite energy and infinitely small wavelength, they contribute infinitely. So you would get infinity. Now you could cut it off at the Planck scale. If you cut off the calculation at the Planck scale, then you get 10 to the minus 10 to the 94 grams per centimeter cubed. So the best understanding that we have in modern science today is that the vacuum energy should be 10 to the 94 grams per centimeter cubed, whereas what's observed is 10 to the minus 29. So if you want to, if, to judge how far your theory is out from your experiment, you're out by a factor of 10 to the 123. Um, so that, that means we really don't understand what's going on. Uh, what we need is a reason to have zero, zero point energy plus small corrections. So, and that, I'm going to argue, comes out of quantum space-time. Now, um, what I've told you is that, so far, is I've just more or less told you working within existing quantum theory and working within existing gravity theory, both 100 years old, this is the picture that we have. The picture is seriously wrong. We're out by a factor of 10 to the 120 in our first calculation. So, what do we need? We need to do something uh, to, to somehow, we need a new approach. And what I'm proposing is that we have to give up the continuum. The continuum is the source of all our problems. We need a new way of thinking about geometry. And so here is a new way of thinking about geometry. So normally, you do geometry. Here's the sphere. If you start doing it uh, with equations, then you would say a sphere is the set of numbers x, y, z, and the x, y, and z coordinates obeying this equation. Okay? So everybody in the room is comfortable, I hope, with this being the equation for that geometry. Now, going back to um, an Arab uh, mathematician, uh, you can, uh, Al Qasami, you can, uh, you can rather think about these x, y, and z not as numbers, but as, as placeholders for numbers. So as abstract symbols. 
So you can say, I don't really need to know what numbers x, y, and z are. I can think of them just as abstract symbols. And I can have rules for manipulating those symbols, which are similar to the rules for numbers. So if I add two numbers, x, y, and z, and then multiply them, they should distribute like that. Similarly, if I multiply two numbers, x and y, I get the same answer as if I multiply them in the other way around. All right? 5 times 3 is the same as 3 times 5. Similarly, if I multiply, I can associate, I can multiply in a different way. I can multiply these two first and then this one, or these two first and then this one. So you can think of, and then if you add to those equations, this equation here, then this algebra, this abstract algebra of symbols, with those rules and this equation, they capture all the information that we have on this side. So this is an algebraic, symbolic way of representing a sphere. Rather than writing down a number of points in your computer, you could rather understand the concepts and write down the rules, which is the finite list. So that's how you would get a computer into a, how you would get a sphere into a computer. But more importantly, we can convert all of our other geometric objects, like curved space-time, which we need for gravity, we can convert them all into a language of algebra. And that's important, because if you want, quantum theory already involves algebra. Um, if you've had some exposure to quantum theory, you will know that. So if you want to unify quantum theory and gravity, it makes sense to convert everything into the same language. And then you can have a chance to unify them. So what we're doing is we're converting geometry into algebra and then we can have a chance of doing quantum gravity. And so converting geometrical things, the first most important bit of geometry is the notion of differentiation. So like the tangent space in, in geometrical terms. So that's expressed algebraically as an operation D, which obeys the, the product rule. If you remember calculus, you'll remember that the differential of, of two things, x and y, is the differential of one times y, of x times y, plus x times the differential of y. This product rule for differentiating. So we add that to our algebraic operations. But more importantly, that's all classical geometry just converted into a new language. But now we can do quantum geometry. And by definition, quantum geometry, we define it as being done on this side, but we relax this commutativity. So we allow, we drop this axiom. We drop that one, maybe replace it by something weaker. So we no longer assume xy is equal to yx. And that happens in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, if you have an exposure to quantum mechanics, you have Heisenberg's uncertainty relations, and they come from Heisenberg's commutation relations, which say that xp, momentum and position, is different from px. So xp is not equal to px. It's the same thing here. x and y are not equal to yx. If we, and so then, when you have that, we are working with a non-commutative algebra, and you have already generalized geometry. And ordinary, ordinary geometry could never obey that. You are now going beyond. And that means you no longer have a continuum, but you can still do geometry. And to give you an example, the, um, this is the simplest example, which uh, I introduced with uh, a Genevan uh, a Swiss physicist, uh, Rueck, in 94, uh, in which we said that, suppose, it's just a model, but uh, an example, but suppose that x and t don't commute. So xt minus tx is some constant, i is the square root of minus 1, and lambda is some constant, times x, and similarly for the others. And here, if, if this affects the quantum gravity effect, then lambda should be 10 to the minus 44 seconds. So it's a very tiny deviation from x and t, x, xt equal to tx. The deviation has a, big, has a factor of 10 to the minus 44 in front of it, so it'd be very un un unnoticed if that was the real world. You wouldn't have noticed it today. But what it means is, is that when you, what it says in other words, is that when you, if you measure where you are, that's x, and then when you are, that's t, you get a different answer than if you first measure when you are, and then measure where you are. This idea that uh, space and time just exists, that you know, our x and t are independent, and can be measured separately, that is what you are losing. And another effect coming out of this, uh, when you analyze the physics of these models, you discover that blue light, more energetic light, travels a little more slowly than red light, or less energetic light. 
Now that is an effect which could be detected. So right now they're building these gravitational interferometers to go into space, and with appropriate tooling, it would cost a couple of million pounds, but you could retool them with different colored lasers, and they basically have a laser beam that goes around, two beams, and then, well, it goes around laser beam, and it interferes with itself when it gets back to the beginning. This is a few kilometers in size, and so the interference can, will detect gravitational waves. But it could be retooled to discover this effect. And right now, as we speak, um, there is a satellite in orbit, a Fermi Glad satellite, which is also looking for this effect. Um, now, what happens here is that there are gamma rays which are emitted in the other side of the universe. Um, so this picture here is an example. Uh, there are these huge bursts of energy called gamma ray bursts. And they travel, this one here, this is, this is actually not the burst itself, but uh, it lights up the whole galaxy. So there's an afterglow period in which the host galaxy, where the, where the burst occurred, is visible to the Hubble telescope. So this is it, Hubble telescope picture. This host galaxy is 12 billion light years away. That means it's literally on the other side of the universe. Um, now those gamma rays travel across the universe. They're released in a range of energies. So when they arrive, the most energetic ones should arrive a few milliseconds differently than the less energetic ones. Even, so even though this value is extremely small, because of the cosmological length scales involved, the effect is theoretically measurable by an statistical analysis, which is taking place, of uh, thousands of gamma ray bursts. And we hope to have a conclusive answer on that in some years. Um, but the point is, is that it's testable. So we have a fundamental problem. We have a theory, at least one proposal, to avoid a continuum. And these things are measurable today in principle. And that means that they are the technology of tomorrow. Now, um, I want to tell you a bit more about time, the way I see it. Now, we're, but we're now venturing uh, even more into my own research, so take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, but anyway, uh, it is to do with quantum anomalies. Now, a quantum anomaly is not what you see, if you, what you might think if you watch uh, Star Trek. Um, Voyager, it's not some kind of unstable uh, space-time vortex that starships fly through, which is what this picture indicates. Um, but actually, in physics, a quantum anomaly is when a quantum system doesn't behave, doesn't respect the symmetries of a classical system. Now, when string theorists first tried to do this, uh, string theory, they did it in four dimensions, and it didn't work, because they had an anomaly too. Anomalies are very common. They're topologic obstructions to the mathematics, which can't be avoided. And that topological obstruction forced them to introduce unseen higher dimensions. And this is one of the weak points of string theory, that you can never see these dimensions. They're just there to make the theory work. In quantum geometry, we have a similar thing. But when you start working with these non-commutative space-time coordinates, x, y, and z, t, with, with non-commutation relations between them, then you discover that the differential calculus, the D that I talked about, um, it also fails. And there's typically an anomaly. And this anomaly uh, requires at least one extra dimension. And this is induced from the geometry of space-time itself. So the way I see it is this extra dimension, which turns out to be time, is induced by the non-commutativity. You can't see this in classical geometry, because in classical geometry, everything commutes. But there's this quantum effect going on, which is visible in quantum geometry, which is, which is invisible in classical geometry. And so just, I, I, haven't got, I can't be too technical in this kind of talk, and I've only got about 10 minutes, uh, but uh, just a tiny bit of quantum high school calculus. So if you remember this picture from your textbooks at school, uh, the differential is the ratio of df to dx. And this, uh, well, that's the, and in the limit, as dx goes to zero, that ratio becomes the slope. That's the, the differential of the function f. We do the same thing in quantum geometry, but now the important thing is that x, x and y, they don't commute. So neither should you assume that x and dx and y commute. So in Newton's time, dx uh, was a number. So, um, but, uh, and so obviously dx times y is the same as y times dx, because dx is a number. But now we've replaced those numbers by algebra, and in our quantum algebra, x and y is not equal to y and x. And similarly, dxy is not necessarily equal to y dx. But you can still do geometry 
and all the things that you learned in high school textbooks, they just go through, as long as you're very careful to not to arbitrarily change the order. So if you just go through your textbooks and don't reverse the order, don't assume this, you can still do most of what you did. Just have more complicated calculations. Um, and so the, uh, another feature of this, which is a very general thing coming out of algebra, is that quantum geometries generally have a differential d, so uh, a direction like d dx, or, but not dx, some direct, some some d, whose commutator, so d times f minus f times d, is generates uh, the differential, the, the the slope df. You have an equation like this. Now. This equation is invisible in classical geometry because in classical geometry, lambda goes to zero, everything is commuting. And in classical geometry, differentials and functions commute, so this is also zero. So this is zero equals zero in classical geometry, and yet it's a completely general feature, generic feature of quantum geometries. So if the real world is a quantum geometry, then we should see a remnant, then this D will exist, and there will be a remnant of it, which will be inexplicable in classical geometry. And that remnant is the wave equation. This d turns out to be the wave equation. So it's invisible in quantum geometry. The d turns out to be typically the wave equation. But also, if you, if you identify d with dt, then this becomes the Schrodinger equation. So you can derive Schrodinger's equation from a deeper principle which is more or less forced on you uh, in algebra. So this is what I was saying, that time is somehow generated by the non commutative space and time, by time I mean the variable which occurs in Schrodinger's equation <coughs> for evolution. Now, the other thing about this uh, is that this algebra uh, d, d equals dt is not unique. I mean, the relations obeyed by d with other variables is not unique. Its freedom can be viewed as the origin of gravity. So it's a bit more technical, but in the model I told you, the model with the, with the Hubble telescope picture, uh, in that model, um, you can do the calculation and for a particle in the presence of a point source of mass m, obeying the appropriate wave equation, you can work out the effect of Schrodinger's equation, and it looks something like this. It has this form, um, where mi is the effective inertial mass of the particle. I start with a particle in my original in my theory, which has mass m, um, compared to the Planck mass. But the effective inertial mass, mi, is not equal to that. I've plotted mi against m. It's this line here. Um, and I've also got an effective gravitational mass, mg. So the gravitational mass and the inertial mass no longer agree with each other. So mg over mi is some function. And you've also got this constant energy term, which is some kind of vacuum energy being created out of the quantum correction. So this is very speculative. This model has not been tested. Um, but and I wouldn't you know, say it was necessarily exactly this, but it's a proof of concept uh, analysis, and it just proves that it's possible that uh, macroscopic, so macroscopic, if you ever could, and actually if you look at the laboratory now, you don't have to go into space for this, you actually can build now, using Bose-Einstein condensates and other, other methods, quantum states in your lab, of, which have mass, uh, not yet approaching the Planck mass, not yet 10 to the minus 5 grams, but only an order of magnitude or two out of it. There's no fundamental reason why both Einstein condensates and such things should eventually be of, Planck, of, of a macroscopic mass, 10 to the minus 5 grams. So what I'm predicting is that as we build quantum states, macroscopic quantum states, they may very well behave differently as they approach the Planck mass uh, than what you expect. The, Gravitational inertial masses may not coincide. So there are predictions which, in theory, are testable in a laboratory using atomic systems. Okay, uh, I haven't got much time, but I, I promised to mention a few uh, the work of some of my collaborators, uh, not collaborators, well, in the book that I mentioned, the book of essays. So another chapter was by Alain Pon, uh, a very great uh, pure mathematician, Bill's medalist. And his idea is that to take what I was talking about and put a little twist on it to understand um, something else fundamental about our world. So here's another fundamental, you know, people say there are no mysteries in the world, uh, you know, it's all been understood by string theorists or whatever, but there are real mysteries in why the world is the way it is. And apart from space and time, I want to point out another mystery. We are very familiar with electrons, 
and up and down quarks which make protons and neutrons. But it turns out that if you look at the zoo of elementary particles, which are visible in the Large Hadron Collider and before that, uh, you see actually that they are just the small, lowest energy ones of a family. The structure of the electron up and down box is repeated three times. Well, repeated uh, three families, uh, maybe more, uh, possibly. So why is there this zoo of elementary particles? Why is this structure repeated? What is going on there? And the answer is no one has any idea. Uh, although we have, you know, fantastically complicated equations called the standard model for elementary particles, those equations have take two pages to write down. There's no conceptual understanding of why they have that structure that they have, which is a very simple structure. So Alan Kant's proposal is that the space-time that I talked about has x, y, and z, t, which could be quantum, the way I discussed, but or they could even be classical in the first approximation. Uh, but that algebra is also tensored or multiplied by a matrix algebra. So this is like having an extra dimension, which are unseen, a bit like what the shrink goes to, but the difference is, this matrix algebra is finite dimensional, so it corresponds to a zero dimensional space, but it's non commutative. So rather than some kind of compact space with curled up extra dimensions, we just, we just have matrices, which are viewed as a zero dimensional non commutative extension of space time. And taking that point of view and looking at its symmetries, the gauge theories, the gauge fields that we observe, and also the Higgs field and some ideas of this structure. Uh, appear, come out quite naturally. Now, at the moment, it's still a bit of a fudge, and it hasn't convinced particle physicists, but to my mind, it has um, a very elegant, has the power to explain things very elegantly. In particular, he does that using two copies of quaternions, which are this algebra here, and it's not written down here, but ij is minus ji. It's a non commutative algebra. Okay. Um, so, the, uh, so that's something else. You do. It's another angle on quantum space-time. Um, something else which is not so directly related to this talk, but um, some people often ask me what happened before the Big Bang. And um, uh, so here is uh, here are Roger Penrose's ideas on that. Uh, so before the people, most people in the audience will have heard of the Big Bang, certainly if you watch the Big Bang Theory. Um, and um, if you go back in time, the universe is somehow smaller and compressed. And if you go back in time, there was some point in the past, where it was just a point, that was the initial singularity. Now, Roger Penrose's idea is that um, you can rescale, you can apply a conformal transformation, which will stretch out the infinity to a line, and will also shrink the infinity in the far future to a line, that's V and I, and then he then matches up the I of a previous universe with the V of our universe. So for him, the question of what happened before the Big Bang was there was a previous universe. And the photons that come out of the Big Bang are actually a continuation of photons that were in the, the, the infinite life of the previous universe. So that's uh, a little bit hard to, uh, to swallow, perhaps, but that's his idea. And, uh, and the, but one thing you should bear in mind is that photons and gravitational waves, they don't experience time because of that time dilation thing I told you about, because they travel at the speed of light. They don't experience time. So there is really, from their point of view, there is no time elapsed between here and us. So there's no reason why they can't carry information from the beginning of the universe or from a previous universe. OK. Um, and in, and in, in particular, he proposes that some remnants of information from the previous universe may be visible in our universe um, in the irregularities in the cosmic microwave background. Okay. I have run out of time, but I would uh, just like to tell you one more thing I've got a captive audience. Um, my view is that time, uh, time's arrow, which is another big question that people always ask me, uh, is actually a sociological construct, the same as on which side of the road to drive on. Now, what I'm saying is, is that, they could very perfect, that laws of physics are actually perfectly invariant under t goes to minus t. And so there could be a part of the universe which is like uh, in which people, in which their t is our minus t. So it's like in, different parts of the, in some, other, some countries, people drive on a different side of the road. As long as those people with a different reverse t don't interact with us, we will never know and never have any problem. But when you do interact, then you would crash, if you, uh, and you would have to then line up your time. So somehow the arrow of time is created 
by us all agreeing to line up consistently in our arrow of time, which we didn't have to do, but we did, because otherwise we would constantly be clashing in our mental points of view. So that's what I mean by the arrow of time is arbitrary, but we choose it as a convention, the same way we choose to drive on the left. I'm not sure which way in India, but... Um, so, uh, just to show, illustrate that, this diagram here shows you a conventional picture of uh, a photon turning into an electron-anti-electron. They are in a magnetic field, so they emit photons, and then somehow they are just adjusted so that they recombine here. The electron and the anti-electron recombine in a flash of light. That's a perfectly allowed event. However, you could read it, and it's just a matter of your interpretation. You could equally well read it as a photon goes along here, suddenly absorbed, out of nowhere, absorbing that photon, appears uh, an electron. The electron goes up here, over here it suddenly disappears in a pop of light, it travels back in time, so a, a positron, from a mathematical point of view, is the same thing as an electron traveling backwards. So it travels back in time um, to appear as the electron we first thought of. And that kind of time loop is, is just, it's, it's perfectly allowed physical process. It's just that um, we can't control it. The, the probability of that happening by chance is quite small. Uh, so it's more a matter of controlling it, which it needs to do with entropy, rather than it being at all impossible. Okay. I'm, not, I'm going to stop here because uh, there's a, a Facebook uh, lecture people uh, may want to go to. Um, but in my second lecture, uh, I think that's confirmed, isn't it? Um, I may have a second lecture in which I'll talk about quantum symmetries. And I think maybe I'll just say one thing uh, here. That, uh, associated to quantum space-time, we need a new way of thinking about symmetry. And the symmetry is also, since I have this philosophy of time being reversible, um, you should, should complement an algebra where you multiply two things. You start with x and y, you multiply them and you obtain x and y. You should also be able to unmultiply where you take something and you kind of unmultiply it. And this unmultiplication map is a fundamental ingredient of the notion of symmetry. And just to explain this, so when you say that there's a symmetry here about this red line, what you really mean is, is that if you have two points of the butterfly x and y in some relationship to each other, so that's x, r, y, and then you flip them, then that will get then if you take the flip of x and the flip of y, then those flips will have the same relationship or some analogous relationship. So that's the notion of symmetry. But in that notion, we have to use the flip map once on the left, and over here we have to use it twice. So we have to double it up. We have to Xerox it. And that's the role of this Xerox map. So there is a new concept of symmetry coming out of quantum space-time, which is the symmetry groups of quantum space-time, or quantum spaces in general. And uh, that symmetry group is a kind of time-reversible concept, which has a both a product and this thing called a co-product. And the group of motions of a quantum space-time are typically a quantum group. And that is the case for the example that I showed you with the Hubble telescope. So it all ties together mathematically very nicely and involves this new concept that emerged in the 1990s called the quantum group. I'll say a bit more in the next lecture. Thank you, sir, for spending your precious time with us and enlightening us with your words and of your wisdom. I request Nidhi to please facilitate, sir, by presenting a memento and a token of thanks. Awesome.